Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. I want to begin by thanking Hillel Neuer and all the staff and volunteers involved in the organization of the Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy. It is more critical than ever. My name is Michael Levitt. I'm a member of Parliament in the House of Commons of Canada and chair of its Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development. Prior to that role, I served as the chair of that committee's subcommittee on international human rights. In both roles, human rights are front and center in everything we do. Just three months ago, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Universal Dec Declaration of Human Rights. After the horrors of the Second World War, which impacted peoples from every corner of the globe, the Declaration res responded to the need to maintain international peace and stability through a framework of principles and standards. Fundamental to that declaration is that human rights are universal rights. There are no Eastern or Western rights, only the fundamental rights and freedoms that every person, regardless of race, religion, creed, or background, is equally entitled to. No matter where we are from, be it Canada, Switzerland, Nicaragua, or Vietnam, whatever our different backgrounds, we all have the same aspirations for the rights and freedoms that far too few of us are privileged to enjoy. Unfortunately, we are seeing a resurgence of gross human rights violations around the world. There are the most obvious cases of arbitrary arrest, torture, and executions of state-sanctioned discrimination based on gender or sexuality or religion or political beliefs or any number of factors. There is the criminalization of political dissent and peaceful assembly where tragic examples in places like Burundi and Turkey come directly to mind. In the case of Syria, the Assad regime's sheer brutality, including gassing its own citizens, has been made possible by the, by the support of Syria's allies, Russia and Iran. This is not simply a single government murdering its citizens. It has help from other countries eager to undermine the international rules-based order and the rights framework that underpins it. The case of Syria has been the biggest human rights catastrophe in the world in decades. Millions displaced, hundreds of thousands dead, obvious war crimes and crimes against humanity. And the response to these atrocities, to great shame, has been much too little, much too late, especially in the halls of the United Nations. We have a moral obligation to confront abuses, not to ignore them. Now, there is no country that is a perfect record or history. My own country has had a shameful moments in our history that we are still recognizing and reconciling, not least of all, our mistreatment of indigenous peoples. But there are glimmers of light too. I am proud of Canada's efforts under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's leadership and the bold work of our Foreign Minister, Christian Freeland, to call out abuses and support the most vulnerable among us. To take a very visible example, Canada has stood steadfast in calling for the release of Raif and Samar Badawi and other human rights defenders, especially women's human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia. Seeing Raif's family here to, with us today is inspirational to continuing the fight until he and others are freed. Yes, there are costs to standing up for our principles, but the cost of, costs of abdicating our responsibility would be much, much greater. In the case of the Lima Group, we've seen a group of countries from across the Americas that has been vocal, active, and effective in standing up for the rights of Venezuelans who have suffered greatly under the cruel and repressive Maduro regime. In the case of Syria, Canada has been clear and principled in its condemnation of the Assad regime and its Iranian and Russian enablers. We proudly welcomed the most vulnerable Syrian refugees to our country. We've created special immigration programs 
to help Yazidis who survived the genocide find safety and a new home in Canada. And we're continuing to help Kurdish and allied forces combat and defeat the scourge of ISIS. In Turkey, we have and must continue to call out the Erdogan government's arbitrary arrest and detention of thousands of men, women, and children, and the crackdown on Kurdish communities, including the arrest of democratically elected leaders. The attempted coup of 2016 does not excuse a disproportionate and reactionary violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Journalists, academics, LGBTQ and women's rights defenders are all under constant threat of arrest or worse. In the case of Burundi, I'm proud of the work our subcommittee on international human, uh, human rights. We studied the crisis and the crackdown by Pierre Nkurunziza's government three years ago, but we have sadly only seen the situation deteriorate further. Repression and the denial of rights, including the arrests of children for doodling in a textbook, continue to escalate. These issues must not be glossed over and cannot be ignored. Behind every speech and statement are real people undergoing real suffering. By promoting human rights, by addressing abuses and advocating for accountability, we work not only to improve the condition of those suffering, but we all benefit in building a safer, more stable and prosperous world. We cannot abandon that advocacy and abdicate these ideals to those who would rather we talk about anything else. The most egregious abusers hate to be in the spotlight, and that is one of our greatest weapons. Shining a light on the darkest corners of humanity is what we are collectively achieving here today. We are giving voice to the voiceless. As we gather here today to listen to the voices of the human rights defenders who every day stand up for the rights and freedoms that many can only dream of, we must bear, in, bear that in mind. We should be forever grateful for these defenders and their forebearers work and never ever stop supporting them. Thank you, merci.